Welcome to part three of the RSET training, Satellite Remote Sensing for Measuring Urban Heat Islands and Constructing Heat Vulnerability Indices. In the third part of the webinar series, we'll be hearing again from guest presenters, Dr. Kathleen Conlin and Dr. Evan Mallon, who will present on integrating socioeconomic data with satellite imagery for constructing heat vulnerability indices. As a reminder, this is the third part of a four-part webinar series running from August 2nd through August 11th. All webinar recordings, presentations, code, question and answer documents, and homework assignment can be accessed from the training page at the link below. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment for this webinar series due by August 25th. Answers must be submitted following the instructions found on the training page. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline of August 25th. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. It is now my pleasure to reintroduce our guest speakers for today's webinar, Dr. Evan Mallon and Dr. Kathleen Conlon. Dr. Mallon is the Senior Analyst for Georgia Tech's Urban Climate Lab, where he focuses on urban heat island mitigation and public health response with international public, private, and academic collaborators while teaching urban environmental planning and design. He is also an ORIS Fellow in the U.S. Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention Climate and Health Program. He serves on the evaluation team, collaborating with cities and states across the United States on improving climate and health adaptations through the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative. In his work, Evan regularly collaborates with academic, business, and governmental partners, training diverse audiences on urban heat risk assessment tools and processes. Dr. Conlon is an assistant professor at the University of California, Davis, jointly appointed in the School of Medicine, Department of Public Health Sciences, and School of Veterinary Medicine, uh, Department of Medicine and Epidemiology. Her research focuses on characterizing how climate change influences human, animal, and environmental health. She employs environmental epidemiological study designs utilizing spatial-temporal exposure assessments and weather, climate, and land use model outputs. She also uses mixed methods for social and behavioral epidemiology. She works with state and local health practitioners to systematically characterize and implement climate change and public health actions in support of building an evidence base for climate change and health interventions. Dr. Conlon, over to you. You can't see like the go to webinar like panel that I can see, right? No, no, that's completely invisible to to us. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, Sean. So today uh, we will help you identify data sources for creating your heat vulnerability indices, which we shorthand call HVIs. We're going to give you some examples of common methods to used in creating these HVIs, and we're going to help you construct your own HVI for an area of interest on your own. So what does it take to construct a heat vulnerability index? Let's revisit a few key concepts from the last time. As a reminder, there are increasing complexity uh, methods. Incre there are methods that have increasing complexity, starting with uh, HVIs that just use individual indicators to those that have unweighted or weighted overlays, to even including principal component analysis. But what's key here is that we want to make sure that our indicators and variables all are unidirectional, such that they confer vulnerability. Meaning, we want to make sure that all of our variables increase. As they increase, they lead to an increase in vulnerability. So, as you may recall, we conceptualize vulnerability as three, as a function of three com components, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And we have listed here variables or indicators that could be used to characterize exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. What's key here is that we want to point out that data can be collected from a wide variety of data sources. So 
it may be the case that you're limited by your most limited factor. For instance, if you have health data that you want to incorporate, um, you may find that that health data is only available for one year. So it's important that the other data selection and variables that you, that you use in your HVI are around that same time period so that you have consistency of data. For, the, for this demonstration and for the homework assignment and the data that we'll provide to you, we're providing these data variables to capture exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity. We're gonna take you through a case study highlighting Detroit, Michigan, uh, which as you know is important to both me and Evan. So those who are not familiar with Detroit, Michigan is in the northern portion of the United States, which is in the northern hemisphere. So it experiences cold winters, and it also experiences warm and humid summers. Detroit itself has a lot of variation in its green space, and residents in Detroit also have low air conditioning prevalence. And epidemiologic research has found that amongst our residents in Detroit, there is a high sensitivity to extreme heat. So when it gets hot, Residents in Detroit have a harder time coping with that. So jumping into our various components and the types of data that we would be able to collect, starting first with exposure. So from day one of our training last week, you were introduced to a new method using Google Earth to, to access Landsat data that can be used to estimate surface temperature. So that's one option that you could explore for collecting your surface temperature data. But another way that we traditionally access land surface temperature is through Earth Explorer. So you can go to Earth Explorer. You do need a login, so it's not immediate access, but it's fairly quick access. Here you can see that in the dropdown, we select the Analysis Ready Data Set, or ARD, which does contain land surface temperature, or LSD. And using this data set, will give you daytime temperature at a 30 meter resolution. And this finer resolution product is really useful for smaller geographies like a city like Detroit, which we see here. It also provides a snapshot of conditions. So it will give you an idea of the relative exposure across the city. So here we draw a red box around our, our study area, the city of Detroit. And we can see in that green highlighted area that that's one scene from our first image from the Landsat satellite. So we, we need more than one scene. Um, so we select another scene, and here we can see that our entire study area is covered. Uh, we then want to select the download button. So here we have an arrow pointing to that icon, so you can download your data. When you select that, you get a lot of options. So it's not particularly straightforward at first if you're new to this, this uh, platform. You'll see here we have metadata, we have surface reflectance, we have brightness, but what we want is that surface temperature. So we select the surface temperature bundle and we get even more options. You can download the whole bundle, but really we're after, in this case, the land surface temperature. So we select this B10 layer. And B10 might not seem intuitive at first, but really what it refers to is the thermal infrared band from which this data is derived. And that will give us our surface temperature. Another exposure data set that's commonly used is the National Land Cover Database, or NLCD. So you may recall that we think of impervious surface as a proxy for temperature or a proxy for the urban heat island intensity. So if you want to think more broadly about which areas may get routinely warmer, you may want to use impervious surface. You can even see here that there's a city grid with that purple and pink uh, moving north and east and west. So we selected the 2016 layer because we're matching that to the other data that we're collecting for this HVI construction, which is around the same time frame. Time frame. Similarly, from this National Land Cover Database, which is US focused, we can also get tree canopy data. Uh, and you can see here that for much of the city of Detroit, which is located in the center to the east um, of this box, um, there's not a lot of tree canopy coverage. And we think that that will be important to include in our HVI. So those will be our exposure data. Now we're thinking about sensitivity, and remember sensitivity is how much a person can be affected by the heat. And oftentimes we see this coming across as health information. 
And one place that you can get health, this health information down to the census tract, which is a fairly refined geography, is from the US CDC 500 Cities Database. Some local health agencies also provide this type of data on their own websites and portals, but it can be challenging to find this data at a fine spatial scale that's useful for your HVI. So as you may recall, we're thinking about HVIs in this case at the city level, so we would want highly resolved uh, spatial data, and this data set provides that for the U.S. Similarly, uh, we can collect sensitivity and adaptive capacity indicators from census data. So adaptive capacity or the, an individual's ability to cope with or modify one's environment to deal with heat exposure, so maybe it's their access or ability to afford air conditioning, uh, is one that is, is very important to capture. And often our HCIs use administrative geographies. And so here we have the census, the U.S. National Census, and that is our geography that we use here in the U.S. One benefit of using a census geography or an administrative geography is that these are designed to be representative of areas of about the same size. So, for instance, a census tract in the U.S. is going to co cover an area of about 2,000 to 4,000 people. And when you download this data and the data that we provide for you, you always want to make sure that you capture your geographic identifiers because we're going to be using that for part of our mapping exercise. Another tool that is useful for capturing this data is Social Explorer. And so this is a fee for, fee for product um, platform that provides pre-processed census data and is available through many different types of institutions. So if you have access to that, you might want to check it out. So as I mentioned, you will be wanting to, eventually will be mapping this. And to, in order to map your HVI, you need to have a shapefile. And so we can get shapefiles from the US Census website, as you see here. Uh, you can also get this type of information from the city's website uh, if they have a large data portal. And many large cities have access or have this type of information, uh, shapefiles sometimes census data, sometimes dem demographic data about the, the city available. One key feature of our census in the United States is that it is done every 10 years. So we want to make sure that the data that we're collecting for our indicators is appropriately matched to the, to the geography or the census geography. So for instance, if we have our disease prevalence data from 2016, that data is going to match spatially to 2010 census because the most recent census, 2020, has been updated and would not reflect what we see in 2016. So you want to be sure that there is continuity as you go on to create your own HVIs and to, uh, compile your own data. And so now Evan will take you through the process of building your HVI data set and mapping your HVI. All right, thank you, Katie. Uh, so I'm going to walk us through the actual mechanics of processing this data that you've now collected uh, to create our HVI map. So nowadays, there are a variety of tools for processing and mapping HVIs, uh, with more free and open source options emerging all the time. In this training, uh, we're going to use Quantum GIS or QGIS, specifically version 3.8, which is free to download for anyone. So since we're talking about HVI mapping, uh, we'll begin with the spatial components in QGIS. Uh, I'll note up here in the corner, in the upper right corner, uh, anytime we're in QGIS, we'll have the QGIS logo up here. Anytime we are working in a spreadsheet editor, like Excel, we'll have a spreadsheet icon. Uh, the add data in QGIS is up here on the left corner. So we'll open that to access our data source manager. So in QGIS, you add different file types separately. In the vector tab, we can add our boundary shape files for the units of geography for your HVI. In the raster tab, we'll add our exposure rasters, such as our land surface temperature, impervious surfaces, and tree canopy. Once we've added our shape files, we'll want to create a unique key ID that will help us join external tabular data to our shape file for further processing and mapping. A key ID gives each unit of geography, 
such as census tracts, a unique identifier that ensures all the data associated with that tract, regardless of source, ends up in the right place. This will help our spatial components and our tabular data work well together across all platforms. We often refer to census geographies by their GOID or FIPS code. FIPS, F-I-P-S, stands for Federal Information Processing System and provides a unique identifier for each geography across the country. GOID 10 means that it is from the 2010 decennial census. One issue we often run into uh, is a code with leading zeros. This can often be ignored when reading the data into a spreadsheet editor like Excel. It might just be removed entirely from that field. I like to force these into a string format to preserve the code in its entirety by including a letter that has to be stored as a string. You can do this uh, in QGIS using the field calculator uh, in your shapefiles attribute table. So here uh, I'm creating a field called FIPS that is a string set equal to simply the letter F plus the GOID 10 code. Make sure the string is the right length to include the full code or you'll have trouble joining later. So this creates a new field in your shapefiles attribute table uh, that is a string format and will not drop any leading zeros. Uh, don't forget to save your edits uh, in these, uh, using the save button to preserve uh, the new field. Uh, we'll repeat this in our data tables uh, to create a unique uh, identical key ID for joining. So we're gonna move over to our spreadsheet editor. Here in our spreadsheet editor, uh, we see GOID again. Here we can use the concatenate function to add that F to our beginning uh, of that string, forcing that string format. To preserve this field, I recommend copying the column and pasting it as values, as we've done in column C here, that's geofips. Uh, that way it's no longer a formula and we can use that code, it will not change, uh, to join all of our data into QGIS. So now let's begin processing our exposure rasters. We'll start by loading the land surface temperature data we downloaded from Earth Explorer. You'll notice here that the units are not what we'd expect. We'll need to convert this to a familiar unit using a scale factor as detailed in the product documentation. I recommend you do this for any remote sensing product you use. For the Landsat ARD surface temperature, We'll need to multiply by our scale factor here is 0 0.003 and so forth, and add 149. We can do this in the raster calculator tool in QGIS. This saves a new raster post calculation. So you'll need to click this three dot button here on the right to set your output information. Then you can multiply your input raster by our scale factor and add 149. But this will produce degrees Kelvin, not Celsius. To convert to a more commonly used metric, subtract 273.15 to get our degrees Celsius. You can now adjust your output symbology in the layer properties for a more familiar look. Right-click the new layer, select layer properties, then symbology to set a color ramp such as blue to red or cool to hot something that fits uh, what we call cartographic convention, it has a very close relationship between what you would expect and what we see on the map. And there we have a more familiar scene. You can clearly see the cool river in the south and some features like dark impervious roads heating up in the sun. We see that same kind of city grid. Uh, you'll also see a few clouds as cool spots on the right. So even though we set the cloud cover to very low in Earth Explorer, you may still need to take that into consideration when selecting your LST scenes. Next, let's move to our other exposure rasters. Here we have Impervious uh, from the National Land Cover dataset, again with some familiar shapes like roads in our city grid. And we can repeat this as well with the tree canopy data that we downloaded from that same source. So next we need to summarize this. Our unit of analysis here is the census tract that we get from the shape files. So how do we summarize that? Uh, here we'll use a tool called Zonal Statistics to summarize our input rasters by census geography shape file or the units we'll be using to map our HVI. 
I think of zonal statistics as turning your shape file into a cookie cutter with the raster as your cookie dough. Each of these geographies in the shape file, here is census tract, will take on the average flavor of all the dough it cuts out of the raster below. In the zonal statistics tool, you'll enter the exposure raster we'd like to use, the shape file we'd like to use as our cookie cutter or our zones, and a label you can use in your output. This tool enters uh, the summary data directly into your shape files attribute table. So it helps to select a meaningful label, especially if you are using multiple exposure indicators. Click the triple dot button here on the right uh, to select which statistics you'd like to return. For an HVI, we often just use the mean, or in this case, the average land surface temperature per census tract. LST mean is now placed directly in our shapefiles attribute table. We can repeat this process with our other exposure rasters like impervious and tree canopy. So at this stage, we can begin to consolidate our tabular HVI data that you got from other sources to keep it all in one place. There are a lot of ways we can join our data, including in R, Spreadsheet Editor, Python, or others. But while we are in QGIS, we can do it here as well. Save your external tables as CSVs and load them into QGIS using the delimited text option in our data source manager. Right-click your shapefile and select Layer Properties to begin your join in the Join tab. Click the plus button to add a new join. Your join layer will be the external table you just added to QGIS, and the join and target fields will be our key IDs, geo FIPS and FIPS created earlier. These need to match, and they need to match perfectly uh, in order to get a clean join. Click OK to complete the join and repeat this process for any additional tables you may have. Each data source that you go to may end up having a different file, and you can join them all this way. Now you can export this data by right-clicking your shapefile and exporting. You can save it as a shapefile if you'd like to preserve all the data you just joined, but here we're going to take it into our spreadsheet editor. So we can save this as a CSV. Click the three dot button next to the file name and set your output information. And if you'd like, you can deselect some fields if you know you will not need them to reduce your data set to a more manageable size. Okay, so we're done with all of our spatial processing. We're done with all of our joining. Now let's talk about constructing our HVI. At this point, we will have some decisions to make. We urge you to consider these questions as you design your HVI. What intervention do you want to implement? Recall that we've, we recommended last time to pick an intervention first, then select only indicators that are relevant to that intervention to locate high priority areas for deployment. In other words, where is this specific intervention needed most in your community? Do you have or need a mix of vulnerability components? That is, do you need indicators of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity in your intervention? Are your indicators independent? Do you weight your indicators? These are all important to consider as you design your HVI. Recall from last time that you'll want to think about how to construct your HVI such that it considers the intervention that you have in mind. So what components are relevant to that intervention? If you're considering an intervention like an urban forestry master plan, you might be interested in tree canopy or tree loss. If you have cooling centers in mind, you might be thinking about sensitivity and adaptive capacity, or who are the people who need the support or resources to adapt? Where will this intervention be needed most? There are also tests you can run to determine the independence of your indicators. If you create a correlation matrix of all your indicators, you may see that two or more are highly correlated. As a general rule, it may be best to remove one or more indicators that correlate very highly, that is above about 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. If you don't remove them, you may be inherently weighting the HVI towards these types of vulnerability by including them as separate measures. This particular uh, correlation matrix was created in R, 
uh, but you can use a variety of tools to create this as well. You'll also need to clean your data set. There may be some census geographies that have no people living in, such as major parks or an airport. We'd recommend sorting your population data set ascending in your spreadsheet editor to pick out all the zeros first, so you can avoid dividing by zero errors later on. This will create a few holes in your HVI, uh, but that is natural. This will happen anytime you have no population or you have incomplete data. Next, we'll want to normalize your variables, such as by converting them into proportions of the population within each track that meet a certain condition. That is that each of your indicators may be on a scale of zero to one. It's important to note here that you'll need to determine a meaningful numerator and denominator. The numerator is the intervention population, and the denominator is the total eligible population, which may be different each time. And I'm going to illustrate that. So consider, for example, uh, a measure of the proportion of each tract population above the age of 65. The numerator is simply the sum of all population cohorts 65 or older, while the denominator is simply the total population in the tract. This will then tell you the proportion of the tract's population that is above age 65. If you have a proportion of 0 0.4, that means that 40% of that tract's population is above the age of 65. However, for a measure like less than high school education, which uh, speaks mostly to adaptive capacity, the US Census counts this population only for those who are above the age of 25. So the numerator is the population over age 25 who did not graduate from high school. And the denominator, in this case, then needs to be the population over age 25 in each census tract. If we included all people in the census tract, including those who are still in school, it would appear that tracts with high populations of young people have this specific vulnerability, even though that is not what we are seeking to measure from a heat vulnerability perspective. So make sure that your denominator is only the population that is eligible. So next we wanna check unidirectionality. As we discussed last time, uh, we'll want to ensure that all variables, uh, have higher values leading to higher vulnerability. Here we see land surface temperature. Higher mean LST means higher heat exposure, which means that the tract is more vulnerable. This one will work for us as it is. But what about tree canopy? Here we have higher values of tree canopy coverage. That actually leads to lower heat exposure because the trees help cool us down. That means less vulnerability. This one will not work for us in our HVI. It's actually protective. To fix this, we can take the complement of the area with tree canopy. That is 100% minus the canopied percentage gives us area without tree canopy. This indicator has higher values leading to higher heat exposure, leading to more vulnerability. This one will now work in our HVI. Next, we'll want to score each indicator. We often do this using z-scores, or the number of standard deviations from the mean within each indicator across your area of interest. This helps us determine relative vulnerability for each indicator within your local population, which is the goal of our HVI. So this would be calculated taking the observed value for that census tract, minus the mean of all values uh, in that indicator across all census tracts, divided by the standard deviation of that indicator across all census tracts. So to accomplish our final scoring, we can uh, simply generate our z-score using the equation on the previous slide, and then use a scoring scheme, such as the Reed et al. 2009 scheme seen here on the right. Uh, you can do this using a series of nested if statements in your spreadsheet editor, such as if the z-score is negative two or lower, set this value to one. If not, then we do use another if statement to check to see if it is between negative two and negative one, setting that to a value of two, and so forth. 
This will be provided as an example along with your homework. So it can get quite uh, complicated. You will find the equation there in the resources that we will be sending. So it's important to note here uh, that we'll be creating then this HVI score for each of your indicators, but we can combine those in different ways. So we're gonna repeat that scoring scheme for each vulnerability indicator for your HVI design, and then we'll combine them. In the event of an unweighted HVI, it's simply going to be the sum of all individual HVI indicator scores. So I have a little example here. If your HVI consisted of say, uh, land surface temperature, which is an exposure indicator, diabetes prevalence, which is a sensitivity indicator, and then three different adaptive capacity indicators, that is less than high school, over 65, and uh, living below the poverty level. Uh, if we have this as an unweighted HVI, we are essentially uh, inherently weighting this toward adaptive capacity. So this is going to be more so uh, an HVI that is focused on adaptive capacity because more of those indicators are going to lead into a higher score for adaptive capacity. So in this case, we may actually want to consider weighting them. A weighted HVI will need to add weights to each indicator or a collection of indicators. So for example, uh, in this HVI, we can uh, say, what if we have each of the components of vulnerability weighted equally? So exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity are all going to be weighted equally in our HVI. To accomplish this, we have exposure plus sensitivity plus the average of our adaptive capacity indicators. That way, each one essentially gets one unit uh, contributing to our HVI, and that way we are not inherently weighting the adaptive capacity components, uh, which can then dominate our HVI. So this is just one example of how we could weight an HVI, but the weighting scheme ultimately will be up to you. All right, so we have our HVI scores now. How do we then map this index? Well, we're gonna use our joining process uh, that we talked about earlier to bring this table back into QGIS. So I recommend in order to preserve all your values, uh, that you save your table, your HVI table, as a CSV. And make sure that you have those uh, key IDs, this FIPS, GeoFIPS, whatever you call it, that needs to live in your table because you're gonna need it to join it back to your shape file. So we're gonna use this join function. You can click that uh, plus button to add a new join. Uh, after right-clicking on your shape file, you're gonna add the processed HVI table as a CSV. Uh, here I've called it Detroit HVI. Uh, and then as your join and target fields, you're going to have the key field in the HVI table and the key field in the shapefile table. Click OK to finish that join. Uh, so now the data lives with your shapefile, but how do we actually review this data? So you can design your map using the symbology tab in the layer properties. Remember, this is the tab we use to set our land surface temperature colors from blue to red. Um, you can change uh, how you are displaying this variable. Uh, up at the top there, I choose graduated to get graduated colors. Uh, what that means is lower values will be a lighter shade, darker uh, shades mean higher values. Uh, and then you're gonna set which field you want to map. So I've selected here my Detroit Tract HVI, which is unweighted. So I'm showing the unweighted version of my HVI. Uh, and then you get to select how your breaks will look. We suggest using quantile, that is an equal count. Because if we're using HVIs uh, to determine relative priority areas across your entire city, we wanna just highlight, uh, say, what is the top, uh, 25% or 20% vulnerable across the entire city, because that's where we wanna prioritize this particular intervention. So you can use whatever scheme you like. Uh, we just like to use uh, quantiles, so you can break the city into even chunks of tracts, highlighting that highest, say, 20, 25%. So you click OK, 
And then there you have it, your map is complete. Uh, so this is really just one example of how you can pull together an HVI. Remember that the way you build your HVI is going to be entirely up to you. And the choices you make in that design are going to influence your outcomes. So we urge you to review, if you did not attend our, our session last time, we urge you to go back and review that one because we cover a lot of different ways that the design will influence your output. And that is all going to be at play here. Um, so we urge you to, uh, to check that out if you were not already with us then. And we urge you to use this as a communication tool. So we want you to be able to build, to construct, to deconstruct, to discuss your HVI with any of your community stakeholders, uh, with decision makers, with planners, with public health officials. Uh, HVIs really are a tool for communication. We hope you will use in the process of designing your interventions and where and how you will deploy them to have equitable, efficient, and effective interventions. I'm going to hand it back to Katie, and she'll tell us about how you can uh, use this time to practice making your own HVI. Great. Thanks, Evan. So now you have some time to practice what you've just learned. We've given you a lot of information about data sources, how you can prepare your data sets to construct your HVI, methods for constructing your HVI, and then mapping it. And so you have about the next 30, 35 minutes to try it on your own. We've provided you with a data set of Detroit that we've just described, um, and you will have access to these slides so that you can follow through and try this in real time. We recognize that you might not finish it entirely, and that's okay. We want you to go ahead and practice what you can so that we can help you help answer any questions in the remaining Q&A session. So for your homework, we will provide you materials, the same data set that you use to just practice that includes your heat vulnerability characteristics for Detroit that are demographic, land use, and temperature data. You'll also have this slide deck so that you can have, be able to refer to the step-by-step -step guidance. No, we just want to state that this data set that we provided to you is organized so that the variables confer vulnerability, meaning that an increase in the variable is an increase in vulnerability. If you were to do this on your own with your own data set, which you are certainly allowed to do, you would want to make sure that those variables are organized in the same way. We won't be able to provide much feedback on your own data set, but it's worth trying if you think that you have a data set that's ready to go to answer your homework questions, which are first, what is your intervention? So we've really dr drilled in, we want you to be thinking about what is the intervention that you might be working on uh, as a result, wh when you get the results of your HVI. We wanna know what indicators you're going to use. So how are you going to capture exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity? How are you planning on weighting those indicators? Are you planning on weighting in, in those indicators? Then we wanna see a map. We wanna see this output. So you've gone through the process of taking the data, putting it into the QGIS or a GIS platform of your choice, mapping it, and having that tool that Evan mentioned is a nice communications tool uh, of your heat vulnerability index. And then we also want to know, lastly, based on those results, based on that map that you get, where do you think you would deploy that intervention? Uh, because that is ultimately how we tie everything back to the purpose of the HVI, uh, which is ultimately to identify relative locations within a space or within a, within a, a jurisdiction on where you can target those interventions to protect people from extreme heat. Thank you, Dr. Mallon and Dr. Collin, for providing us with such a wonderful practical on creating your own heat vulnerability indices. We've been receiving questions from participants, and for those online who would like to ask a question to Dr. Mallon and Dr. Collin, please enter your question in the question and answer box. We will answer them in the order they were received. We will post the Q&A document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. 
Below is the contact information for Dr. Conlon and Dr. Mallon, along with links to the training page and the RSET website. We encourage everyone to sign up on the RSET listserv for notifications to upcoming webinars. Each month, we offer new remote sensing trainings on land, air quality, disasters, climate, and water resources. We will now transition to the question and answer session of today's training. We appreciate your attention and please submit your questions if you haven't already. We will get through as many as possible in the time remaining. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, this is Amita Mehta and um, we have a few minutes left. So we thought that we'll address the question and answer. Um, first of all, thanks Katie and Evan for the presentation and the demonstration of how to get HVI. So what we're gonna do is first of all, just go through the question and answers and hope um, you were able to download the data. If you are still having trouble, you can try it later. Um, and you will have time to work on the exercise between now and, ne and the next session. So we'll start with uh, questions and uh, Iman will uh, be answering the questions, helping with the questions. So first question is, how is surface reflectance different from the top of atmosphere data and which is more applica applicable to use in representing exposure? In terms of LSD, surface reflectance temperature values are relatively high compared to T TOA. Sure, yeah, so uh, I would not actually recommend using either of these data sources directly uh, if you can access the uh, analysis ready data set, the ARD data set from Landsat, because that's already processed. So yes, there will be a difference between these two products, um, but if possible, I would recommend just going straight to the ARD. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I'll note is whenever we're doing a, uh, an urban scale heat risk analysis or something like this um, HVI that we're building, uh, I recommend using data that is as close as possible to your target population. So what that means is um, looking more toward the surface, uh, because that is where the population, most of the population will be, rather than kind of a top of the atmosphere. That's more of a regional kind of analysis. However, um, ideally we, we would get more of an air temperature measurement than just land surface temperature. Now there is some correlation between the two and it depends on your land cover, uh, but unfortunately the air temperature data sets are very rarely available on the scope and scale uh, that is needed for these analyses and is readily available from something like land surface temperature through Landsat. So those uh, air temperature data sets are most often derived through either field measurements. Uh, you might have a distributed uh, sensor network across an entire city. That's fairly rare uh, or slightly more common. You might have a regional climate model that is more of a city by city or project by project basis, kind of a one-off uh, generation of this data for an air temperature based analysis. And so this is most often created on demand, which means it substantially limits the availability of that data. So it's more common to see this kind of uh, land surface temperature or just uh, surface based analysis because we can derive that more readily from uh, remote sensing data sets. So yes, it's not always ideal, but it is a great tool that we can use. Again, uh, as we mentioned in, in this, uh, presentation to determine the relative prioritization across your area of interest, which areas are more vulnerable than others or get warmer than others as compared to that same geography. All right, so I, I see we have a question uh, on uh, two bands for LST calculation, band 10 and band 11. What is the difference in the final results of the two bands? So uh, band 10 and 11, they're both within the thermal infrared range of wavelengths. Uh, they do have slightly differing ranges of wavelengths. So band uh, 10 and band 11 are both within that thermal infrared range. Very slight difference between those two specific wavelengths that they are looking for in, in, this, in their sensors. So 
Uh, I more often, uh, when I review the, uh, the ARD data set from Landsat C-band 10, uh, used to derive that land surface temperature. Uh, however, both are viable sources for LST, uh, given that they're within that range. So generally, we're, we're going to ignore most of the other bands. Uh, if we're looking specifically for thermal imagery, we're going to be focusing in on that thermal infrared range of wavelengths. So both band 10 and 11 will give you um, the ability to derive that. But again, if you're using the Landsat ARD data set that is already calculated for you, um, please do review our last session, part three or part two in this series, uh, because we do talk a little bit about um, uh, that, that, uh, that difference in the bands. Um, actually, I guess that was from today. So we have the, um, uh, the B10 image that is in the slides. So you'll see that uh, that guidance there if you review the slides from today. All right. Um, so we can move on to question three. Uh, does the Census Bureau's differential privacy process impact the ACS data sets or just the 2020 decennial data below the state level? Um, so this is a relatively new policy that's been introduced by uh, the Census Bureau in the United States. Uh, basically, uh, what the Census is trying to do with this is to protect individual data. We don't want to be uh, directly identifying any individual in this census. We want to look more at aggregate numbers. We, we look more at um, averages across these geographies. Uh, or total counts across the geographies, not uh, anything that we can directly attribute to any specific person. So that's what this differential policy process means. It existed in the 2010 data set, uh, but it has been updated for 2020. So there are slightly more strict policies uh, enacted for the 2020 decennial census, which means that anything that came before it, it's not going to have the similar kinds of protections um, in, that, in those data sets. Um, these are going to extend, according to the documentation that I've seen, to the American Community Survey, that's the ACS, um, starting in 2025. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the ACS, um, basically this is a, uh, it's also known as the long form. Uh, it is a more comprehensive questionnaire that's uh, sent out to uh, fewer people, but will ask more in-depth information. So many of the indicators that we might use in an HBI may actually only be collected in the ACS, not in the decennial census. The, the decennial census goes out to more people. We have a more comprehensive uh, scope to the decennial census. But in order to make sure everyone can answer it and answer it thoroughly, it has fewer questions. So we don't collect the same amount of data. So the ACS is often based on these kinds of statistical relationships, these kind of inferences that we can have from the samples that we are able to collect. We can infer what that might mean for the larger population. Now, these are conducted, or they, they are released anyway, in one, three, and five-year increments, each with just more data. Uh, so they collect more data over these longer time periods, and that can reduce your uncertainty. Now, I very rarely seen an HVI actually take this uncertainty into account. Um, there are some analyses out there on what uncertainty could mean for an HVI. Uh, however, the way that we recommend using HVIs, again, for this relative prioritization across your scope, uh, your, your geography of interest, that you can indeed just use the standard practice of using those numbers as reported without bringing in those kinds of uncertainties, because it will still do a good job at showing um, the relative vulnerability from one area to another, even if there is some uncertainty in that. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty that's brought into um, just your HVI design process. You have a lot of choices that you get to make, and each of those is going to impact the outcome. So I invite you to review part two of this session where we go much more in depth into the, uh, the sensitivities of HVIs and what your design choices could mean for those outputs. Um, because that is a very subjective exercise. You have a lot of choices you're going to make, all of which are going to uh, affect the outcome. So it's really more about how you use your HBI as a communication tool than treating the HBI output as the absolute truth uh, that should guide all of your decisions. 
So in general, we don't tend to work those uncertainties into the results, uh, but we do use um, either the decennial census or the ACS as reported uh, because it still can offer a lot of useful guidance depending on how you use it. Great, thank you. So the next question is, given the Landsat Collection 2 ARD dataset is available for the US only on the USGS Earth Explorer site, is there a published workflow or for generating this data for other territories? So uh, if you refer to the website of Landsat ARD data, um, it says that global Landsat ARD um, data are in development for uh, global uh, region. Uh, globally, they will be available soon. And here's the reference that you may want to look at uh, to see how the data were produced. Um, right now, though, they're only available for US, as you mentioned. Um, in near future, I think global ARD will also be available. So the next question is, why would we drop correlated variables when constructing the index? Yeah, you don't need to drop the correlated variables. Uh, this is going to be up to you whether you want to drop these or even check for them. Um, I simply bring this up to show that you may inherently be weighting your HVI toward particular indicators by including them as independent when in fact they may be closely related. So I'll refer again to our last session, part two, we talk more about this uh, assumption of independence between your indicators. Um, but uh, if you, for example, have an HBI that includes three separate indicators, those being over 65, living alone, and over 65 and living alone, if you include those all as separate indicators, they will contribute equally to the final HBI score. And that may inherently weight the HVI toward these concepts, unless you account for the potential overlap by applying an additional weighting scheme. So this is something that is, again, it's a design choice that's, that would be entirely up to you. About how, if or how you might want to weight uh, your indicators, just know that if you include several very closely related indicators, even without weighting them explicitly, you may be inherently or unknowingly weighting them toward these ideas, these concepts. These concepts here may be something like social isolation. Um, and so that may be inflated uh, in your, your, your total HVI score uh, as a result. So that's just something I wanted to flag as uh, something to keep in mind as you're generating your HVIs. Okay, question six. Um, we have crews in the field in urban and rural areas. Summers in Louisiana have high temperatures and humidity. Can I use this approach to warn both rural and urban crews? Absolutely. So you can set your geography to whatever scale you would like. Uh, I would just recommend that you keep your geography uh, based on particular scales of policy. So for example, if you're considering uh, statewide policy or even a national policy, that's where you might bring in a state or national HBI. Um, but if you're really talking about neighborhood specific, uh, I wouldn't go much larger than any given city at a time. Now, what you might do in an urban and rural setting is use maybe more of a regional analysis. You might include an urban core and then uh, some of the suburbs and exurbs. You might do this at a county level, or you might just zoom out a little bit to make sure that you're getting both the urban and the rural. Um, however, there's another tool that I might recommend if you're specifically working with uh, deployed crews in the field, uh, particularly in an area like Louisiana, which I absolutely know uh, indeed has high temperatures and very high humidity. It can get dangerously warm, and particularly when we think of this as a heat index, not just as the air temperature, when we have both high heat and humidity at the same time. You might use something like a National Weather Service declared heat warning to, to look at more of an acute basis. So on this day, or maybe looking ahead into a forecast, we think that there may be unsafe conditions for outdoor work. Your outdoor workers may actually have uh, a, a very high risk of uh, heat fatigue or illness or even heat stroke. Um, 
And that is something that uh, you might want to try and plan for. You know, make sure that they get out early enough in the morning and are not working at the peak of the day, something like that. So that could be a little bit more acute, uh, whereas the HVI method is a little bit more of a long-term analysis. This is more of an average conditions kind of analysis where you would be looking at um, sort of longer term phenomena, something like uh, you know, these indicators like people over age of 65, that's not something that changes on a day-to-day -day basis. That might change on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, but not so much on a day-to-day. -day. So this is looking at more average conditions. This is kind of for longer term policies. Uh, so there's a little bit of a difference there in how you might use the HBI. I also want to mention in this question that there is some emerging research uh, showing that rural areas may in fact be at higher vulnerability. Even though we often talk about the uh, urban heat island effect and really warming up our urban areas, the exposure then might be higher in cities. However, the adaptive capacity might be lower in rural areas. For example, there may be a lower density of uh, healthcare resources or healthcare facilities. They may be very, very far from, say, a hospital. So if they do succumb to heat exhaustion, they don't have such immediate access to get to the care that they might need to recover. So this is something that uh, is still emerging now, uh, but it is very much a concern. Uh, we don't only want to be focusing these kinds of heat risk analyses in our urban cores. We do want to be looking at this more at a regional scale uh, or just not leaving the rural areas behind. Because when there is a short-term event like a heat wave, high temperatures throughout an entire region, rural areas can be very much at risk as well and may have fewer resources to cope with that heat. So this is absolutely something that should be applied in both urban and rural contexts. That, that's important. Um, question seven, when using a data set that has a few census tracts with no data values, when conducting the HVI, how are these tracts given index values? You're going to notice this as well in the homework or in the exercise uh, that we, we just went through. Um, when you join your data set, uh, you're going to find that some holes appear. It's pretty rare to have 100% data coverage, depending on how you design your HVI, across the entire city. For example, in this very same data set that we've uh, released on the website that you can download, um, for example, uh, diabetes data is not available in one of the tracks. So just by joining that uh, diabetes data set, we lose that tract because it just doesn't exist for that tract. So you're gonna find that there's a lot of uh, holes that might start appearing based on having incomplete data. Not always no data, but often incomplete data across the various data sets you might be compiling. You're also gonna find some tracts where you just have zero population. I recommend that you drop those right away. That's kind of part of the data cleaning procedure, uh, but it also will depend on what kind of HVI you're constructing. So those no data tracks may be something like a large park, an airport, or uh, non-residential land where you just have a zero population. Um, that is okay to remove generally for an HVI because then you're not gonna be deploying any of your resources towards these areas that have no population. You also don't want to be including those in your HVI, uh, including only the data that you have because it's gonna be at a different scale. So if you add up only the HVI scores for the indicators that you do have in those areas, uh, you're not going to add up to the same score as some of the other tracks that do have complete data. So that means that inherently that score is going to be lower. And so it's not really a comparable uh, kind of analysis. So I recommend just removing those entirely. However, if you have something like uh, a tree planting plan, that is your uh, intended intervention, that may still be viable in non-residential areas because it can still help cool the city down. If you have a, an area that's highly impervious but no one lives there, replacing that with a lot of vegetation could have more of a regional scale cooling effect. You might still want to try and do it. You can still use a more exposure-based HVI to help prioritize those areas for tree planting. But on the other hand, uh, a cooling center may not be appropriate to locate an area with zero population because you're not gonna have anyone that that cooling center is serving. So this very much is, uh, like everything in HVI, is going to depend on the intervention that you have in mind, that you would like to use the HVI to help prioritize. 
Great. Uh, so next question is, how do I assign weights to the indicators? This is ultimately up to you. Um, I have a few examples in the data sets that we provided, so you can open those in a spreadsheet editor, click on the cells, and uh, for the weighted HVI, that is, I believe, HVI underscore W for weighted, you can see one example of a weighted HVI scheme. And what I did in that one was basically just weighted them equally across the different components of vulnerability, that is exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity. It's just one example of what can be done for a weighting scheme. If you, if you want to have a generalized HVI where you say each of these components are equally important for our analysis, but we don't want to inherently weight them by having more indicators in one uh, component over another. So um, you may design an HVI a different way. Uh, for example, you may have uh, a tree planting plan like we've talked about weighted more towards exposure indicators while a cooling center may be weighted more towards adaptive capacity or sensitivity. Where are the people who will be most affected by this heat such that they can get respite in a cooling center? So you may apply the weights that way. Uh, you can apply them just by a simple multiplication factor or say a proportion of the total HVI score. I have an example here. A weighted HVI score may be equal to 0 0.8 times the indicator HVI score 1 plus 0 0.2 times the indicator score number 2. So this example is an HVI with only two indicators. It's a pretty simple HVI. And we may think that the first HVI score or indicator is much more important than the other. So I'm gonna put this at an 80% of the total should really be consisting of this indicator's HVI score component. The other one, we want to include it, it just isn't nearly as important for the intervention we have in mind. So we're gonna include it, but it's only gonna have a 20% contribution to the overall HVI score. So this is another way that you can think of these HVI weighting schemes, is just where do I want to uh, place a greater emphasis on particular indicators over others, because we think they may be more relevant to this indicator, or to the, uh, to the HVI uh, design, by which I mean the uh, intervention that you have in mind that you would like to use this HVI to help you locate where that may be most effective. So that's, it's ultimately going to be up to you, but that's just a, a couple of, of different examples in how you can uh, start to design your weighting schemes. Wonderful. Uh, question nine is, I just noticed that the HVI U uh, you calculated seems to be a normal distribution. Is that a regular property of HVI? This will depend uh, on your data. Uh, so if your data is more or less normally distributed, you may see more of a uh, normally distributed HVI in the end. It's going to depend on uh, what kind of processing you do, um, how, uh, uh, how biased your data might be. For example, if you're looking at a geography with very high inequity, you may find a large proportion of the population uh, that has one condition, uh, and then not much in between, and a very large population that has no condition. You know, this could be income, something like that. So the distribution will impact that. Now, it is more common to see a normal distribution if you use z-scores like we've used here. Again, you do not need to um, use z-scores. It's just one, one useful way to do it, and this is how they do it in that Reed et al. 2009 scheme. So uh, if you use z-scores, that's more or less... Uh, going to result in, in a relatively normal um, distribution of scores because that is sort of the way that the z-score is set up. So it is all relative to the mean and standard deviation of a given indicator within your data set. So you will have some negative, some positive, and that's all just going to depend on the distribution of the underlying data. So uh, long way to say, not always normal, uh, but depending on the underlying data, you may end up with a normally distributed HVI. Now, we also talked about last time um, that uh, how you map your HVI will also be very important. Uh, we recommend um, that you might use something like the quantile, uh, say five bins, whereas the, as, as such that the highest HVI score in those bins 
uh, is really just showing if you were to break this uh, geography into even buckets of vulnerability, well, the highest scoring HDIs are, um, say, the, the top 20% most vulnerable. Maybe that's where we um, will place our emphasis for these interventions. So unfortunately, I believe we're out of time. I think that may be the last question we'll be able to address uh, for now. Yes. Again, feel free to reach out to us uh, directly of our contact information. Um, yeah, thanks everyone yeah. for joining us. Thanks, thanks Evan. And so uh, question 10, I'm just going to, I have given some references here, uh, which uh, regionally connect air pollution. There's studies going on uh, relating air pollution to UHI and human health. So you may want to check some of the references out. And we're almost out of time. So uh, the questions which are remaining, we will address them and we'll post the QA on the website. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for attending today's session. Uh, thanks Katie and Ivan for your um, presentations and the, this question answer session. Uh, we'll see you on Thursday at the same time. That's the fourth session. And so, well, thanks again. And uh, so on behalf of the RSET team, uh, thank you all. I uh, will see you on Thursday.